It's my great pleasure to be here today. Like Mark said, I was a student here. I was actually a, a summer fellow. And now to be returning as a lecturer is something that I always wanted to do, and I'm very happy about that. <clears throat> my talk is about the recession of 1797, and specifically I'm going to be arguing that it was created by uh, credit expansion on the part of the First Bank of the United States. So I have envisioned this as a kind of continuation of a Rothbardian research program so those of you familiar with Austrian economics know Rothbard bequeathed to us two active research agendas, at least two, one being applied anarcho-capitalism, which is near and dear to my heart, but I'm not going to be talking about that today, and the other one is revisionist economic history, which is what I am going to be engaged in. So I have a picture here of Alexander Hamilton, and I was at a talk a couple of years ago where Tom DiLorenzo was presenting his book on Hamilton's curse, and he described Hamilton as a rat who betrayed the American Revolution. Now, I don't know about you, but I was offended by this because, in my opinion, Professor DiLorenzo was far too kind <laughs> to Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> so, uh, specifically, so there was, the Bank of the United States was opened its doors for operation in December of 1791. And the first recession in American history happened in December of, well, started in December of 1796. And it was a mere five years after the creation of de facto central banking in the United States. Now, what interests me about this connection is it hasn't really been explored by any Austrian economist. So in Tom DiLorenzo's book, he argues that Hamilton bequeathed to us a legacy of central banking which has resulted in macroeconomic fluctuations that we're still dealing with today. However, he doesn't specifically relate the first recession in United States history to central bank expansion. So what I see myself doing is kind of pinning the tail on the donkey. Uh, in this case, the donkey being the arrogant, overweening Alexander Hamilton and the economic program of the nationalists. So, okay. Let me just. <clears throat> Many of you don't know anything about the recession of 1797. Many of you probably aren't aware that there was a recession in 1797. So, by way of introduction, oh, I need my notes. Sorry about that. So, by way of introduction, uh, I'm going to begin with some historical details about the recession. This is Robert Morris, the infamous Robert Morris, who was the sort of uh, guiding father of Alexander Hamilton and, and his nationalist party. And in February, February 1798, after a spectacular fall from fortune, uh, Morris, who was the, the famed financier of the revolution and was previously one of the wealthiest men in America, uh, was arrested and put in debtor's prison. So he and his partner, John Nicholson, had issued $10 million in paper debt claims. And when this paper pyramid collapsed, uh, he was ruined and the economic loss was felt by his extensive list of creditors, which included pretty much everyone of prominence in America at that time. Uh, Morris and Nicholson weren't alone in their fate. Uh, they're just the biggest players in a recognized bubble of speculation. Uh, this bubble began to burst in late 1796, leaving a flurry of economic failure and distress in its wake. Uh, so Jefferson proved prescient when he wrote, quote, the prison is full of the most reputable merchants, and it is understood that the scene has not yet got to its height, close quote. So that was a letter to Madison. Uh, the contemporary Theodore Sedgwick was delighted by the, the bursting of this bubble. So he said, quote, uh, this, you know, the bursting of this bubble is a very happy circumstance, though vast numbers, and among them many worthy people, are involved and ruined by it, close quote. So he's sort of like the Murray Rothbard of his day. I could just imagine Murray. <laughs> he's like, ah, oh, you got to flush out those down vessels. <laughs> uh, so the uh, ruin of these well-prominent traders <clears throat> 
uh, wasn't contained to them alone, but it was, there's actually more widespread economic downturn. And as you can see from these figures on GDP per capita, uh, it, GDP fell from a peak of one thousand per capita fell from a peak of one thousand two hundred and eighty four dollars in seventeen ninety six to one thousand two hundred and sixteen dollars in seventeen ninety eight which was a decrease of about five point three percent and industrial production fell as well. This is the index by davis that 's a little <laughs> little less suspect than the GDP figures that we have, and it shows a, a fall in industrial production of a little over 7%. So the nascent American economy was experiencing its first recession. So what caused this recession? <laughs> so I'm going to argue that it was caused by bank expansion on behalf of an overexpansion by the, engaged by the Bank of the United States. So uh, when it <coughs> began operations, it immediately started to pump in uh, new injections of credit into the economy with an at initial capitalization of two million. I'll show you numbers in a minute here, but you know it reached about a number of about seven seven million by 1794, and this was on top of an original money supply of like 10 to 15 million. So that's a pretty significant significant increase. So obviously, all this credit expansion resulted in inflation and a reduction in interest rates. So the uh, inflation sort of created a this, I guess a, a disjunct or uh, marginal disincentives, I guess, to saving and lending. And there was malinvestment. We'll get to that. And this sort of overexpansion was brought brought back into heel through the price species flow mechanism. Uh, in other words, uh, there was an overexpansion which created disparities in the price level between America and other economies. Uh, so this caused a reduction in net exports, and to pay for the you know trade balance, specie was exported abroad. There was a credit contraction and a monetary <laughs> contraction, uh, you know, beginning in late 1796. And <clears throat> I guess uh, high re highly leveraged traders experienced a credit crunch, and they began uh, suffering economic failures. Suppose I should say a couple of words really quick about the, the the Bank of the United States itself. It sort of represents the culmination of Hamilton's liquidity expansion scheme of the 1790s. Uh, so there was multiple planks of this program. The most pertinent ones to this discussion were the assumption of the state and continental Congress debts that were issued to finance the revolution. So Hamilton, of course, wanted to assume these debts to create uh, a class of special special interest that would support the, the federal government, and he wanted to benefit uh, uh, northeastern mercantilist interests. And so, as part of his speculation scheme, uh, the the individuals who wanted to buy into the uh, stock of the first bank of the United States had to pay three fourths in uh, newly created uh, federal government debt, bonds, you know, debt instruments, bonds. And then the, the bank itself would also provide the means to sort of pay back its obligations. So it's like the circularity. I think Tom DiLorenzo has it right when he calls it a bank job. Um, so I guess the first question we have to explore is, was the expansion that took place uh, just a normal credit expansion, or was it an overexpansion? So expansion of credit in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? In an advancing economy, that's what we want. It represents, you know, causes increased wealth. Uh, the problem is only if there is an overexpansion, which is why central banking is bad. So in the early 1790s, a lot of historians and economists have argued that uh, the American economy was credit constrained. It was liquidity constrained. So in other words... Individuals, my, uh, traders or merchants might have ideas that for business ventures that would potentially be profitable, would probably be profitable, but they're unable to obtain financing because of the lack of scarce specie. And so this expansion by the U.S., far from being a bad thing, was actually just a means in which people could accomplish the, you know, the gains from trade. Uh, 
uh, intermediated through the financial system of the bank. And so I, I've labeled that the benign expansion hypothesis. And there's, you know, there's some truth to the fact that the economy was credit constrained. But in opposition to this benign expansion hypothesis, I want to alter my, uh, offer up my alternative malignant expansion hypothesis, in which I claim that the BUS overexpanded, setting into motion a, a classic trade cycle, the sort that you know Ricardo would have talked about. So whenever you're engaging in this sort of applied historical work, you have to ask yourself two questions. One, does the economic theory you're using make sense? And then two, you know, did it actually happen? So this is sort of like the difference between validity and applicability in praxeological law. And so on the first step, uh, subject of the theoretical potential for an overexpansion by the Bank of the United States, uh, first I have to explain what overexpansion means. It means an expansion of credit be, or beyond the amount that people would want to hold at the price of par with specie. So it's just basically a surplus. And normally, under conditions of unrestricted or you know, free competition in banking, the expansion of credit is limited by the marginal rising costs of keeping you know, deposits and, and notes in circulation. And so there's you know, the increasing marginal costs of getting people to hold on to your notes. There's declining marginal benefits, right, say, of, of making loans. And so the optimal amount, uh, you know, the most profitable level of expansion for any given bank is given by, you know, equating the marginal benefits and the marginal costs of, of the bank expansion. Uh, this sort of, you know, so in this way, like competition is what provides the, the check against an overexpansion. So if one bank engages in expansion beyond the profit maximizing level, then it suffers a loss of reserves to other uh, banks in the banking system, or, you know, so either, if, if I put a bunch of notes that people don't want, they either present it back to me for direct redemption of specie, or, probably more probably, they deposit it in their bank account, at their own bank, and then that bank, uh, you know, takes the claims, gives it back to the first issuing bank, and asks for, you know, it to honor the redemption of its notes, and either way, the, the bank, over-expanding bank will suffer a loss of reserves and is forced to contract. Now, the sort of uh, competitive check on the overissuance of, of credit doesn't exist with respect to a central bank or a bank that enjoyed legal privileges like the First Bank of the United States. So the First Bank of the United States wasn't a central bank quite in the sense that we understand that today. It didn't regulate the commercial banking system. Uh, although, eh, so for that reason, Richard Timberlake and others have argued that it couldn't have been intended to be a central bank. On the other hand, it did sort of start engaging in monetary policy right off the start, right from the start. So in an article by Colin Sill and Wright, they talk about, uh, you know, there was a, this sort of expansion set off a financial panic in 1792, and Hamilton, as part of the Treasury, along with the bank, engaged in sort of an early form of open market operations. So you can, you can see that, that it's sort of a quasi-central bank, uh, my preferred definition of a central bank is any bank that enjoys exclusive legal privileges and is also the government's banker. Okay, so under this definition, then the first bank of the United States would be a central bank. Now, what, what specifically were its legal privileges? Well, the first one was an exemption on unit banking. So at the time, uh, if you wanted to start a bank, usually you had to get a charter from the state and you weren't allowed to, you know, branch across states or usually even to have multiple branches within the same state. So obviously this is going to, you know, weaken the banking system quite a bit. But in terms of the first bank of the United States, they want to overcome this sort of weak banking system, you know, this hurdle to having strong banking. So they wanted to set up a, a more centralized bank that would have, bran you know, branch offices in several states, so like first five cities and then seven, right, and so on. And the second legal privilege that it had was its notes were accepted in, in payment of custom duties so you could pay your taxes in it. Uh, this is kind of like a quasi-legal tender status privilege. And so the, the upshot of all this is that the Bank of the United States notes were, were useful in ways that the notes of other banks were not. Right? They were good as gold for most purposes, including paying your taxes, and so what this means is that if the Bank of the United States, the central bank, was to engage in an overexpansion, it wouldn't immediately be disciplined by competition. 
Right? The other banks, on the contrary, <laughs> would find it advantageous to hold these notes as reserves. Right? Why? Because it's sort of a, a, a cheaper substitute for gold, or it was actually silver at this time, for specie. So, on the theoretical side at least, it seems to me that there could be an overexpansion. So the question is, was there an overexpansion? Well, in order to engage this empirical evidence, uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions first. How big was the expansion, like against compared to the existing money supply? But the key, you know, link in my argument is going to hinge on whether or not you think it's big enough to have influenced uh, prices. So, you know, the, the wholesale level of prices, interest rates, and, and international trade. Uh, well, let's see how big it was. So here's the so selected items from the balance sheet of the First Bank of the United States. The, the red note is the, the bank notes and deposits, and you can see it starts off at basic well zero in 1791, and then shoots up immediately to about two or three million. There's this sort of minor contraction that takes place, and in 1792, around March of 1792, there was actually a securities, the first securities bubble popped in the United States, and so. Some economists have argued that it was this contraction that caused that. But you can see it's relatively minor, right? It's sort of almost an uninterrupted expansion all the way until 1794. And so you see, by 1794, it hits a peak of about 7 million ish, and then it kind of tapers off, right, for uh, some of the remaining years. And as you can see, uh, here's a, a graph of the mon some select monetary components. This is the graph I just showed you, basically, on the U.S. bank notes and deposits. And, you know, this is the amount of specie, and then this is the M1, whatever, the, the, the full money supply. And you can see that it's, it's basically uh, going to be an inflation all the way until 1795, and then uh, there's, you know, suddenly the, the deflation after that. So there's kind of like this wild swing in prices. To, as, you know, evidence of that, here's the CPI inflation rate over the 1790s. You can see in the early half, inflation was below 5%. And after the, the U.S. goes into business, it shoots up, you know, to double digits, 10%, 14%. Uh, and then, you know, suddenly it collapses. So. <laughs> Just to anticipate my argument, a sudden swing's probably not a good thing, right? For economic activity. Same with uh, wholesale prices. They're even more volatile than the, you know, average price level. So you have, you know, a negative 30% price, wholesale price, price is falling by 30% in 1791, and then all of a sudden it shoots up to 60% and then shoots back down to negative 30%, right? Well, What's the consequence of, so I'm, for the moment I just want to concentrate on the expansion, so, and, and the inflation. So what's going to be the immediate consequence of this inflation? Well, you would assume that, uh, the, if the market, it, so it enters the, the market in a specific point, right? So there's, uh, Cantillon effects. And presumably, if it enters in the market for loanable funds, and the market's going to clear after increasing the supply, then the price has to fall. And that's all I'm showing here. So uh, what I'm saying is that the, these are, this is just a calculation of the real yield. So interest rate data is difficult to find um, in the 1790s. This is the, but this is the real or inflation adjusted yield, this red line. Oh, sorry. So this is the real yield or the inflation adjusted uh, Interest rate, basically. So the standard methodology is the uh, the rate on U.S. Treasuries represents sort of like the riskless inflation rate. Well, that's not necessarily the case here because all well, these U.S. six percent bonds were new, and maybe there was a risk premium. But in that case, then you know some of that uh, it, it would actually be this line would be too high. <laughs> so it's actually you know good for my argument, not bad. So you can see. That starting around 1792-ish, uh, you know, the real interest rate takes a steep nosedive, actually becoming negative. And so you have to think about what kind of incentive is this going to give to entrepreneurs. And what I'm like, I have no direct evidence of this here, right? But I'm arguing that uh, this expansion creates 
a deviation in the uh, you know interest rate, and it's making it lower than what the natural rate is. So the actual rate's lower than the natural rate, and you're going to get you know, investment. It's classical sort of BUS style cycle. Um, I mean, in, in 1795, the real interest rate's like negative 10 percent. So if I'm you know trying to make an investment, and I know that I'm going to be paying back money that's worth 10% less than the money I borrowed, let's say. And this is like free money. They're, you know, they're paying me to take out a loan. Well, why wouldn't I, right? So, so it sort of makes sense. Oh. So, okay, so, the, I'm, so there's this overexpansion by the BUS. Well, what, what corrects the overexpansion? So I just argued that it's not going to be by competition. But as an accountant, we know if, if there's a disequ well, disequilibrium, it's there's going to be forces that tend to bring you back into equilibrium, right? Or at least into line with what people's preferences are. And in this case, the correction mechanism is brought about by the price species flow mechanism. So as I was explaining earlier, uh, you know, the differential in price levels causes people, you know, Americans to purchase uh, more foreign goods, foreigners to purchase less American goods. You have to clear the trade deficit. You export money abroad. Right, but the problem with this, well, there's two problems with this, as opposed to the, uh, what, you know, under the, you know, free competition. And the first one is that the process of adjustment slow, right? So I'm arguing this takes several years for this whole this coordination to work itself out, and it, you know, it requires a sort of painful monetary contraction to take effect. And the other thing is the loss of reserves aren't limited to the overissuing bank, but affects the banking system as a whole, right? So, you know, foreigners are asking, you know, or people are making purchases abroad, and to pay for that, they're asking, they need specie, and the specie is coming from wherever their bank is, not necessarily the overissuing bank. <clears throat> well, okay, so was there actually a <laughs> uh, decline in X exports? Well, let's take a look at the current account, or actually the capital account, or what, either one. There's the option. So, <laughs> all right, well, we notice that inflation sort of Here's where the expand, like the credit expansion, sort of tapered off. 1794, where where the sort of uh, price swing began, and around 1794, 1795. Well, you know, there's uh, exportation of specie of 13 million dollars. That's basically the same as the drop that I showed you earlier in the monetary components, right? So where's the where's the gold going? Like earlier, I showed you that. Uh, you know, the specie <laughs> was declining. Well, where did it go? Well, presumably people aren't melting down silver to make candlesticks, right? It's going overseas. And that's just what I'm showing you here. Uh, okay, so why, why was this a problem? Well, you can see, starting in 1795, the, the, there's a there's a, this correction that I explained before. The prices start falling and the real interest rates shoot up. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and so so the real interest rates start shooting up. And at the time, <laughs> what you have is people are mostly borrowing in accordance with the real bills doctrine, right? So there's short-term lending. And so if I'm financing, uh, you know, my enterprise, I'm basically borrowing short and then have to keep rolling it over. Well, what happens to these uh, traders, you know, starting, well, just look at it. You know, what, what, when would you predict the problem, problem is going to set in, right? It's going to set in around 17, 1797. So uh, they're, <clears throat> so the, the entrepreneurs go and they're trying to, re, you know, refinance basically. And... They're suffering from a lack of credit, or at least they can only find credit to continue their enterprises at really high interest rates, basically. So they complain about the lack of money. You know, money is expensive, is I think what they call it. So basically what, what the problem is, is that this credit crunch is squeezing them out, and, and they all start, start failing. I just briefly want to talk about some alternative explanations. So, eh, this, 
The recession hasn't been talked about too much by either historians or economists. Uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Doug North, he basically ignores it, right? So in his book, his early work on uh, economic growth, he's looking at this period, you know, the early from like 1792 to 1860, and he argues that, uh, you know, this was a period of, uh, you know, very strong and sustained economic growth in the United States, and he sort of ignores the temporary deviations. He's, he's sort of aware that there was like this minor contraction that took place, uh, but he, he just sort of assumes it away uh, and argues that it was just following you know, events overseas. So here's a quote. It says, quote, One lead look no further than to events in Europe to account for almost every twist and turn in the fortunes of the American economy during these years, close quote. I think this sort of ignores the or overlooks. I guess he wasn't really interested in macroeconomic fluctuations, but it sort of just overlooks um, the potential of things going on in the domestic economy to create discoordination. And uh, there's this other guy, Richard Chu, who's a historian who wrote an article very recently, and he argues that the, the recession was caused when the Bank of England suspended specie payments of 17, in February of 1797, and then that combined with French privateering during the quasi-war and the yellow fever sort of combined to create this like you know perfect storm. And to me, this is kind of a historian's explanation. So usually, you know, if there's a problem, right, they don't have, usually don't have theory, economic theory. So they say, well, what happened before that could have caused it? Anything that looks bad, uh, they sort of just latch on to. And in this case, uh, the, the yellow fever, well, you know, there's war and disease basically throughout this period. So why specifically does it happen now? And the argument that the Bank of England's suspension of specie payments caused the Depression might make sense, but remember, it's kind of hard to understand how suspension of specie payments in February 1797 can cause an economic contraction that began in February 1796, or I mean in December of 1796. So the timing is kind of off for his explanation. I'm not going to argue that this uh, suspension of specie payments by England didn't influence things. I mean, obviously that's uh, going to be the problem because this domestic economy that's already experiencing problems getting uh, uh, getting credit now it's sort of its other alternative source of credits removed and so there's nowhere nowhere for for people to get money to complete these sort of investments that they have now just for like in 30 seconds I just want to show what was this overinvestment or malinvestment well it's kind of hard to and the evidence is kind of sparse, but here is just a preliminary table of highly capital intensive industries that went, you know, bankrupt over the, like, in, so this is the year where they started. These are the failure rates. So in particularly in manufacturing, most of these large, particularly like the SUM, Society for Useful Manufacturers, uh, you know, went belly up. And so it seems like there's some, there's definitely some evidence that maybe it's not just a sort of overinvestment story a la, you know, Lucas, but there might actually be a discoordination in the intertemporal structure of production, uh, as argued by you know, sort of macro-based uh, or macro-based micro macroeconomics or capital-based macroeconomics. So, oh, so in conclusion, I just want to say that I hope I've persuaded you into looking into uh, so this in more detail. Other Austrian scholars. Um, I believe the recession of 1797 constituted a failure of legally privileged central banking, right, first by artificially lowering interest rates and stimulating investment and discoordination, and then by creating a county-wide contraction as the credit was forced to, uh, to come back into equilibrium. So thank you.